With headlines like these, it's easy to feel despair. It's easy to feel paralyzed. If you are anything like me, these kinds of headlines might send you into a tailspin. You might want to go home, sit on the couch, tuck into a half gallon of ice cream and binge watch your favorite Netflix series, and maybe call a friend and complain about the state of the world. In fact, there is a growing body of evidence that suggests that we would not be alone. Just last week, any of you who live in California may have heard there was a KQED California report reporting on more climate support groups growing up around the nation. And the American Psychological Association even has a guide for practitioners who are dealing with individuals and communities feeling a growing sense of climate despair. Yet, if you were to turn your head a different way, if you were to read a little bit further down the newspaper, if you were to look even just in the same day, you could see very different headlines. And in fact, I've challenged myself and my students to do this. On those same days, headlines may be proclaiming a very different story. And I'm here today to suggest that there's a different way to think about the climate narrative. We have the power to transform that narrative. And I believe that all of you are here today because you are excited about transforming that narrative. In fact, you said yes to an invitation today to come to an event on climate solutions. And you have heard from all of my colleagues today, starting from the president through all of the other speakers. And you will finish with the students today. All of us are talking about climate solutions. We can transform that narrative, and in fact, I would suggest that it's imperative that we transform that narrative, because narrative is powerful. Narrative is the story that we tell ourselves as individuals. It's also the story that we tell our societies. And there are many exciting and positive things that are happening. As you've heard today, we have a load of research. We have incredible technologies. We've just heard Sally and Rosemary talking about the technologies that are being adopted, that are being transformed into policies. Just several weeks ago, we had more than six million people engaged around the world from the ground up in positive climate actions around the world. These are people who are saying that they want their governments to do something different. And these environmental policies that have been implemented since the first Earth Day, more than 50 years ago, these are truly transforming the way that we think about the world around us. So to me, these are reasons that we should have hope. And today we are here to talk about Stanford and the things that are happening here on campus and the reasons that we here at Stanford have hope. You've just heard Steve say that he comes to work every day feeling hopeful, and I feel the same way. So today I will talk about three reasons that we here at Stanford and other universities and academics are feeling incredibly hopeful and in trying to change this narrative, and we invite you to come along with us on that. One is that we are already in the midst of transforming this narrative from a narrative of crisis to one of hope and innovation. Two is that we are not working in the ivory tower. You've heard examples today, exciting examples of how we're getting out into the community. We're working with government agencies, working with companies to take this ivory tower research that may have been thought of at one time as that and really change the way that we're working in the world. And three, we are training dynamic, engaged, innovative, and passionate leaders who are transforming the way we work today and for generations into the future. So first, transforming that narrative. Before I go any further, I have to dispel this myth that I am some ridiculous Pollyanna, and that I'm talking about sunshine and rainbows kind of hope. Uh, any of you out there who know me may, may accuse me of that a little bit, and I admit I am an optimistic person by nature. But with regards to climate, it is challenging to feel that way. And I will say that I, I don't come to this narrative easily. It's one that I've come to after working for more than two decades in the environmental and climate fields. I worked in nonprofits in DC for two decades before I came to Stanford, and I've been here for about 10 years. My research group and I focus on looking at questions around what moves people and individuals and communities to positive environmental behavior. We look at what are the barriers to that and what are the motivations for that. And what we know and what others who study behavioral science know is that the narrative of fear and the narrative of crisis is not the way to move people to action. People are not moved to action by telling them that the sky is falling and it's your fault. 
When you tell people that, it's not a way to get people to jump out of bed in the morning with an excitement and a way to join the day. What we do know from behavioral science is that when you give people a data-based goal and you tell them that their individual actions can add up with those of others in their community, with those of others in their company or their nonprofit organization, that their country is working toward a positive goal, that's what gets people excited about moving forward toward a positive and a thriving future. I'll give you one example of a project on which a colleague and I have been working, my colleague Tom Robinson in the med school here, and I've been working with the Girl Scouts in Northern California for more than six years. And with these girls, we use, we use elements from behavioral science, from learning sciences, from health sciences, to think about positive, small steps and actions that these girls can take with their friends and Girl Scouts and with their families. So these girls then go home and talk to their parents and have ongoing dialogue with each other. We have actions that the girls can take on their own to build their self-efficacy, and also actions that the girls can take with their parents to build what we call response efficacy, which is that they can see that it's actually making a difference in terms of energy efficiency. When the girls come back together with each other, they can see how those actions add up over time. So this has benefits for the economics of their home, for the conversations within their home, which as a mom to a 12-year-old, I will tell you that anything that enhances conversation within the home is, is a positive in my book. <laughs> Uh, and we also see that over time, this actually has significant energy savings. We've done randomized control trial studies in this project, and we see that over time, this actually persists. So you may say this is only a few hundred girls in Northern California, and that, that is part of it, but it also has a broader impact across the country. We have more than 1.7 million Girl Scouts across the country. There are more than 750,000 adult leaders. And when you think about something like that, how it adds up over time, this is the way that we begin to create a movement. This is also an excellent example of how we take science that starts within a university and we move it out of the ivory tower into something that's actionable for our community. And this is the second reason I have for hope here, which is that we are truly every single day at Stanford dispelling this myth of the ivory tower. I don't need to spend a lot of time on this today because you've heard from every single one of my colleagues today talking about the work that we are doing outside of the ivory tower. I talk with my students all the time about how much I don't agree with the myth of the ivory tower. I don't think it actually even exists. I think that Stanford is the real world. I think every question we have derives from the real world. And one example I will give you from my own work is that I am fortunate to be the Sykes Family Director of the Emmett Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources. And we are a program that is based on a solutions orientation. I have the great pleasure of seeing our students from their application to their time here on campus to the time that they go out into the world as the alumni. And in fact, I believe we might have some alumni here today, which is great and exciting. And our students tell us that the reason they come to Stanford and the reason they come to EIPER is because of our solutions orientation, because they have the opportunity to work with our hundreds of faculty from across campus to actually go out into the field to work shoulder to shoulder and learn from those faculty members about how to develop research questions, how to collect data, how to analyze those data, and then how to put those data into practice, working with policymakers, working with corporations, practitioners around the world. And then those students take that same orientation back with them when they go out into jobs in the world. So this is one example of how at Stanford we train our students in a way that is actionable in the real world. And this leads to my third reason for hope which is that here at Stanford, we are fostering dynamic and passionate leaders today and tomorrow. Our students are eager. They are not waiting to become leaders. When they are here, they are already leaders. So we see students in programs like EIPER and across the university who are here, and they are already leaders when they're here. And they go out in the world and continue in that leadership path. That said, I am not suggesting that we don't do something special here. As you've seen again from my colleagues today, you can see that the programs and the kinds of research that our students uh, receive, where they receive training when they're here is essential. We are helping them develop these skill sets, these mindsets, these frameworks that allow them to be more effective leaders. We help them learn about systems thinking. We help them learn about prototyping. We help them learn about technology, as you've just seen, about public health perspectives. All of those are critical aspects to allow them to be more effective when they go out into the world. My talk today was about enacting the purposeful university. And as you heard at the beginning from the president, 
That is an essential piece of Stanford from the very beginning of the founding of this university. How do we enact the purposeful university in the world? And I would suggest that our students are doing that every single day. And that is a critical piece of what gives me hope. And I would suggest to you that as you think about transforming that crisis narrative for climate and every other pressing environmental issue that we have, transforming that crisis narrative comes through looking at these hopeful leaders, looking at these leaders who are already making a difference today and for tomorrow. So while these issues are incredibly challenging, while they are thorny, while they are boundary crossing, and certainly at times terrifying, where I find hope, and I invite you to join me in that, is to think about our students who are dynamic leaders. And when I look at them and I see the hope in their eyes, I see the innovative questions they're asking, I see the way that they're making meaning of their work and the curiosity they bring to it, I think, you know, if I could just bottle that energy and that enthusiasm and, and that joy that they take forward into the world, well then, you know, I, I actually don't need to finish that sentence. I would invite all of you to finish that sentence for yourself when you meet them and think about the kind of magic that would be possible in the world. Thank you.